Okay, thank you everyone uh, for coming today. Um, we welcome Dr. Li Ye, um, a professor of chemistry, to present her research work on chemistry education and research. Uh, it's a very insightful uh, work. I think it would be very helpful for many um, professors, not just in chemistry, but also across the STEM field. Okay, without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Ye. Thank you, Dr. Shen, for your kind introduction. Um, uh, I'm so happy today to uh, share my research with you. Uh, let me share my screen before I start. All right. Good. Can you see? Yes. Okay, so let me do the mode of presenting more. Okay, good. Yes. All right, um, thanks everyone for being here today. Uh, you know, I know it's a busy time of the semester, so um, thank you for taking the time to join me uh, in this afternoon. Uh, my name is Li Ye. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry uh, in the College of Science and Math. And so my research is focused on chemistry education, research and practice. And then particularly, um, I uh, studied uh, the development and the evaluation of innovat innovative teaching and the learning learner center assessments um, in post-secondary chemistry. And so here is outline for today's talk. Uh, I'm gonna share uh, my professional background and I will um, briefly uh, introduce what is um, chemistry education research, um, which is uh, we use a CER as a short name. And also I will share uh, several studies that uh, I have done at uh, CSUN uh, since I joined CSUN um, from 2017. And also I will share um, a couple of projects I'm planning uh, to do in the future. And uh, then uh, with an argument with my colleagues and uh, students. Um, so my background, I uh, got my bachelor degree in biotechnology and uh, master in biochemical engineering in China. Uh, so my uh, master thesis was about to it was study um, the mic um, the uh, drug delivery system. So we made uh, mouse models uh, with diabetes and uh, liver cancer, and then. You know, we treat them with a, a special um, type of uh, drugs uh, that made with uh, mycoencapsulation, and then we, uh, you know, inject those um, drugs uh, to those mice, mice, and then we study the therapeutics and also uh, try to figure out how long uh, the drugs uh, can be delivered uh, and then um, cure the disease for those uh, mouse models. And right after that, I got a uh, position uh, in a, bio, a pharmaceutical company called Biotech, Bioway um, Biotech. And then uh, I was a project manager to manage projects uh, related to uh, neural growth uh, factor. And those are um, yeah, the drugs that to cure uh, um, the disease that related to the uh, uh, damage for the nerves. nerves, nerves. Um, and after that, uh, I uh, came to the U.S. with my family, and then at that time, I wasn't sure uh, what I want to do. And then I, um, you know, joined the Department of the Chemistry at uh, University of South Florida. And then after that, um, I did some rotation in, you know, a couple of labs and tried to figure out what I want to do. And luckily, at that year, uh, we had a couple of uh, faculty, uh, new faculty, join the department who are doing chemistry education research. And so I joined one of the research group that, um, you know, have um, uh, um, working on um, chemo research and um, that um, took me about three years. And you can see at the bottom, there was a picture with uh, me and my husband and then uh, the other uh, two other advisors of us. And uh, we graduated together at the same year in the same department. And then uh, at that time, we also uh, uh, decided to start a family. So we had our daughter who graduated um, with us when we, uh, she was two years old. And then uh, after I graduated uh, with my PhD and I um, came to CSUN as a assistant professor uh, in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. All right, so uh, what is uh, chemistry education research? Um, so uh, chemistry education research 
uh, we um, are designated as a subdivision of, um, you know, based on subdivision by the ACS, which is American Soci uh, Chemical Society. And we also belong to one of the uh, broader community called Deeper Discipline Based Educational Research. And so uh, we have, um, our goals is to try to improve uh, teaching and learning in uh, chemistry at all level. And then usually our research are um, theory based. So we have uh, used um, education theory to um, design our research and use a guidance. And we collect evidence uh, systematically to see what we designed uh, if you know what we design of this innovative teaching actually um, you know improve um, learning uh, from students, and we have uh, mainly two different kinds of research methodology. Uh, one is quantitative, the other one is qualitative, and um, so if we do both, we call it a mixed method. And so what we do for quantitative uh, methods usually they are with um, numbers. And so we collect um, the, the numbers uh, that can be included with, uh, for example, Likert scaled surveys, uh, concept um, inventories, or uh, test scores of students. And then we um, use um, those data to uh, figure out some patterns uh, for the student learning in chemistry. And then we use uh, statistical analysis to analyze the patterns of those large amount of uh, numbers of data. And then the other, um, area of it is qualitative approach. So for qualitative approach that we collect data usually with a smaller sample and then we study in depth of those sample and that included uh, in-depth interviews and uh, you know, response, a written um, response or uh, it could also have a conceptual understanding of students based on you know, uh, certain topics. And it also it can be included with classroom uh, observations or uh, drawing. And so for those data, uh, they are texture data. So we try to figure out the patterns by using uh, open coding, uh, thematic analysis, and also sometimes we have uh, framework-based analysis. All right, so uh, my research, uh, usually uh, we you know, care about uh, teaching. Of course, we want to improve teaching. So uh, for my research uh, is particularly in, uh, in in focus on the evaluation of those teaching methods or assessments or a particular um, academic programs that we design to improve student experience. And so we want to know uh, what was there an effect for the um, you know, particular design of the teaching method. And then if yes, how big was the effect? And also what caused the effect? And so those are the main interests of my research. And since I came to CSUN, I've conducted a series of the studies, try to improve student learning in chemistry. And uh, I will uh, share a couple of the research uh, studies, uh, including the uh, online simulations and uh, learner-centered chemistry assessments, and also the uh, supplemental instruction program that we designed to improve student learning uh, in, with you um, in this afternoon. Um, so I have been very lucky to work with, uh, you know, a group of very talented students at CSUN. CSUN is so diverse and uh, I have been, you know, lucky to work with students from uh, many countries and then, you know, uh, all kinds of backgrounds. And so I just want to acknowledge that and then before I move on uh, to my studies. Without them, I cannot do much uh, with my projects. All right, so the first study I want to share uh, is about online interactive simulation. And so this is a, a study guided by the uh, theory called cognitive law theory. And so this theory talk about how human processing process information in our, in our brain. So usually there are uh, two kinds of memory. Uh, one is called working memory, and that is a short-term memory. Usually it just holds about uh, 10 minutes in our head. And so um, there are limited capacity. And once we uh, pass that to working memory, the information can be stored into the long-term memory that uh, is through a set of uh, schemas. And so the schemas are uh, mental models. They can be you know, complicated or simple. And depending on uh, the learner's interest, how familiar they are with the topics and uh, the way they learn the topics. 
And so uh, the goal of uh, our project for this project is trying to uh, use this um, theory as a guidance, try to you know, break down this um, cognitive load for uh, students. So that way they can store uh, more information in a working memory and then so as to move to the long-term memory. And another one uh, is about, um, is a, is a um, theory that uh, uh, named uh, Johnston's triangle. That is a you know, famous one that in chemistry, uh, he published a paper uh, that in 1991, uh, he talks about you know, why science is so difficult to learn. You know, we all know that you know, science are very important, but uh, science are also um, relatively difficult to learn. And so he pointed out that uh, the reason why science is so difficult to learn is uh, many of the you know, uh, topics we're talking about, they are not tangible which, you know, especially for younger kids, when they learn um, something new, they will try to uh, relay something they already know about, right? So if you uh, ask, uh, you know, teach them what is a cat, they may have seen a cat before. So they have some image in, head, in their head already, knowing about, you know, how, you know, cat can be round uh, this way, and then they have fairy. Um, but for science, uh, we study, um, you know, multiple representations, uh, if especially we focus on, in chemistry, we focus on microscopic level, atoms, molecules, structures, and shapes, right? So those are the things that students may not see through their eyes. And also we have, uh, you know, our own language, symbolic language, we have, you know, H2O, this is the chemical formula, right? So those kind of um, language, uh, the student may not be able to connect with what they see in their eyes. And so that's the difficult part that how can we help students to connect with the different representations, including the macroscopic, they see through their eyes, right? They know about this phenomenon through their experience in everyday life, and then connected with this, um, the microscopic level of the molecular level of the molecules, and also the symbolic level uh, of those um, chemical formulas and the chemical equations. And so uh, with that, um, for this project, we hope that uh, we utilize this uh, online free um, simulation uh, tools to help students to um, lower their cognitive load and also build the connections across this uh, multiple re representations. And so uh, based on the literature, um, there are some benefits of the simulation including visualization, including connection with the real world example, and also is engaging in the fun. Uh, and also uh, they have those interactive features. Uh, students actually can make it hands-on, manipulate uh, some of the variables and uh, understand better of you know, this uh, science phenomena. And also um, it is cost-effective. Uh, if you know, we can use that to help students prepare for the laboratory. And uh, so that will be, uh, you know, uh, help them to um, better understand the laboratory, and then they will be, you know, um, also save some time uh, when they actually go into the lab to do the experiments. All right, so uh, for my research, uh, for this study, what we have done is that we had a quasi experiment designed. And so we try to teach students uh, the topics of gas lot and properties um, with the uh, uh, two different teaching methods. One method is we have used um, the uh, simulation. Um, it's called Fast Simulation. It's a you know free um, simulation website. Uh, there's many many of the uh, simulation over there. We can use mostly uh, uh, stain um, related uh, activities, and so uh, we have used this um, for the gas law uh, simulation. And then the other one we used uh, as a control group. Uh, is the process-oriented guided inquiry learning. So this uh, short name is POGO. So POGO has been very uh, well developed uh, in you know, publications and we know that um, POGO has been very um, effective to improve student conceptual understanding and build their inquiry uh, before the uh, concepts has been uh, formally introduced. And so uh, in this study, we have a, uh, two classes. They are taught by the same instructor. And we have one class use simulation, the other one use POGO. And so um, we have followed the same, um, same um, pattern or same way of teaching uh, for the class. So first, you know, we did this pretest to um, test the student's prior knowledge 
the uh, the you know the the class actually before we implement these activities, and then um, during the seventy five minutes of lecture, we first implemented uh, you know for these activity at the uh, two different classes, and then after the um, the activity they have done it uh, student have done that individually, and then we had pair student up to uh, have some peer discussion. And then after that, we gave student the post-test. Uh, the post-test is the same as the pre-test to see how this activity you know, um, make any differences for uh, the student learning in this topic. And so here is more concrete idea of uh, how the activity look like. And so for the POGO activity, we just took the activity directly from the book that has been published by um, POGO team. And so as you can see, in this worksheet, uh, students are given the uh, for, uh, equation about the gas law and some information about the variables and some uh, you know, questions they can think about this equation. And uh, this is just a portion of it. And so on the right, for the uh, gas law uh, pop, um, the, for the simulation uh, group, and so we uh, have you know, uh, shared the website with them and we gave them a worksheet. And so this worksheet, um, mainly we have um, those experiments we want students to perform. And so here's one of the example, as you can see. And so we were, um, the, uh, we give the students some um, prompts so they can you know, have some guidance on how to uh, manipulate those variables on the side of the simulation. And then they can, uh, you know, uh, at the bottom, right, you can see here's a bucket where they can change the temperature of it and then then they can see the uh, pressure change according, uh, according to the temperature change. And so uh, also we had some questions, ask them to you know, think about it, what's going on, what the relationship has been happened uh, between the variables and student, will, um, uh, student conduct a series of those experiments um, during the activities. And then uh, for this um, study, we have two research questions. We want to know how do the online simulation activity impact students' conceptual understanding as compared to POGO activity? And uh, what are the student experience of the use of the online simulation activity? So here's um, the quant quantitative results. And so we have both groups um, we uh, studied. We studied, um, so you can see on the left-hand side, Here's a, a measure uh, we use called learning game. Learning game, we use post-test minus the pre-test. So the test is a nine item multiple choice question, um, conceptual questions. Uh, those questions are uh, designed by a group of um, researcher. And then we have already done the, um, the pilot uh, test with a large number of uh, students. So they are already you know, being uh, validated to be uh, very good for measurements. And so we find uh, you can see the POGO group and then the simulation group. And then so here's the um, box plot. And then we can see the box represents 50% of the student. Right? So um, most of the student did increase uh, from the post to pre after the uh, activity. And both groups are relatively similar in that sense. Right? So that is a, a, the overall picture of it. All right, so and then uh, how then we also uh, study that, you know, uh, is there any um, differences between these two groups in terms of improving from the pre to post? And so what we did is to uh, did, we did a ANOVA, which is to compare student needs uh, from the pre to post. And also um, we can actually look at the intervention uh, interaction between the two different kinds of teaching methods. So as we can see, uh, from the left hind um, a graph, we can see that for both group, uh, the um, the student learning gain has been improved, right? And then, um, sorry, and then um, these improvement uh, was significant, uh, statistically significant. And then uh, we also uh, want to know if you know either one actually improved more uh, for uh, the student learning gain. Uh, the uh, result was not significant uh, interaction between the two teaching method which means uh, the two teaching methods were comparable to improved uh, student uh, learning games, uh, which makes sense because POGO has been you know, uh, improved, uh, it has been um, reported um, widely about how that can be improved student understanding. So now we just you know, have the simulation we want to compare to that. 
Um, but the more interesting uh, part is that when we uh, look at uh, the distribution, again, you know, we look at um, the, so on these the graph, you can see each bar uh, that represents one student. And then we want to look at, you know, which one actually engage student more in a higher level. And so when we compare for the simulation in POGO, uh, both of them have relatively similar percentage of students have positive learning gain. There will be, they will, they uh, were about 60, 60%. And then, um, then, but when we look at uh, um, the one that actually gained three and above, right, which is, uh, you know, a three out of nine questions. Right, so we actually find stimulation actually um, had um, more, 17% more of the student gain, more than three uh, out of the nine questions. So that is exciting. And that uh, shows that, you know, student, uh, the simulation actually can engage student with a higher achieving uh, learning. So, uh, you know, we not only doing the quantitative analysis, we also um, survey students, ask them their perspective, you know, their experience of learning and using the simulation activity. And so what we do is that uh, we survey them, we ask them, um, you know, do you believe that uh, these uh, activity actually improve your uh, conceptual learning for this topic of gas? And also, you know, why do you believe that, you know, how, what is your experience of um, being interacted with this uh, simulation activity? And so um, for uh, the analysis, uh, we did open coding. And so what is open coding is that we usually uh, don't have anything in mind. We uh, just look at the data and we have multiple researchers look at the data and think about what are the possible codes. And we uh, each list our codes uh, from the data and we'll meet. And then we think about, you know, what are the potential themes that are coming out from the codes. And uh, uh, once we have the initial code, we will um, analyze a portion of the data, for example, 20% of the data independently using those um, themes. And then that's the first round. And then we will meet and then compare. And then we will uh, see, you know, how the initial theme can be used uh, to um, analyze uh, the data and how consistent they are uh, from multiple uh, researchers. And if there's any disagreement, we will meet and uh, uh, you know discuss about it. And then uh, and here uh, we uh, you know reach this interrater reliability is something that we will code another round of the data about another twenty percent, and then we will uh, compare again for our agreement. And then uh, uh, if we reached seventy percent of the agreement, then we will move on to finalize the thing and then code uh, the remaining data used to finalize the thing. All right, so uh, the data uh, tells us that uh, students had fun, students like it, and they also believe that, um, you know, the simulation um, activity helped them um, learn this uh, guess law topic. And then almost everyone uh, said, uh, yes, that helped. And uh, the themes that are coming up from students' quotes, including uh, they believe that uh, the uh, simulation improved their visualization of the chemical representations. And then they also simplify the process for them, uh, uh, reduce the coffee bloat, make them, uh, you know, to, they may, um, they can actually uh, look at the variables uh, separately, not just looking at the composite with the, all of the variable together. And uh, they uh, also uh, believe that uh, that uh, simulation um, prompt, um, um, prompt conception understanding. And also they were able to do some, you know, um, interactive, fun, hands-on activities in the class and uh, related to the real world, um, real world uh, phenomenon. And so in general, uh, so um, most of the students that really reported they uh, enjoying the activity and believe that the activity um, improved their learning. So here is just one example I just uh, share. And then, uh, you know, we also want to know, yeah, you know, is this only um, worked for one topic or for, you know, other topics as well. So what we have done, we just done the same study, um, kind of same study designed with other topics and in the lab, uh, different kinds of settings. And so we um, also implemented the uh, different uh, simulation activity related to atomic interactions and bond energy. Uh, this is uh, similar design as I shared before in the lecture setting. And we also have done uh, molecular shape and polarity uh, in the lab setting. And so this one, uh, actually I collaborate with um, my collaborate, uh, collaborators at uh, UC Riverside. And so uh, this one is also uh, a project funded by California Learning Lab. 
So for that project, we did a little, uh, little different um, study. So what we did is we actually asked uh, student volunteers from uh, different uh, class, uh, chemistry classes across the board. And we asked them to come to a laboratory and then perform the simulation. And uh, on top of that, um, the comparison group, we did a traditional um, video of the lecture video. And then, you know, one group just watched the traditional lecture video. The other group did the simulation um, activity. And uh, we have another uh, comparison, which is uh, general feedback versus um, targeted feedback. Uh, we designed formative assessment that associated with the activity of the simulation. And then for the general feedback basically is that, you know, every time a student did something wrong, we give them a video link and saying, watch this video. And that video uh, talks about, you know, how to, you know, get the correct answer and then the reasoning of that. And, but for targeted feedback, we did multiple videos for each of the possible wrong answers. And then we made a specific video to uh, explain the reasoning of why this is not the correct answer and then how do you reach the correct answer. So basically what we try to do is to address these misconceptions that has been found in the literature and then hope that, hope, hope that we can help students uh, at their level, right? If they don't understand certain thing and then we can help them with that. And so that's like a couple of comparisons. And uh, so um, this project um, is um, still um, ongoing with you know, some analysis now. So hopefully we will uh, know much details about that. Um, another um, other, other, um, other setting, uh, we also implement a couple of simulation activity in a laboratory design, laboratory. Uh, so this is one of the, my student, uh, Emily uh, on, the, on the right um, top, uh, uh, she's uh, her thesis um, uh, project. So, so what we try to do is to implement this simulation activity as a pre-lab, uh, so pre-lab activity. So um, not only helping students with the conceptual understanding, but also we hope that uh, to help students with the hands-on part. So the, for example, the acid-based titration lab, there's a lot of um, uh, concepts related to that, complicated uh, calculation related to that, and so in this simulation in particular, uh, they will give them a real world scenario and they pretend themselves as a analytical chemist, right? And then um, they are um, actually the simulation work them through with the whole process of what they are supposed to do, similar uh, process uh, in an actual lab and then prepare them, you know, to do some simple things, dissolving a solid by right? using pipette. So that at least they are prepared for those um, procedure they are going to do in a lab. And also there are a couple of uh, calculation type of examples that for them to prepare for them uh, to understand the process of calculations. And uh, so for the, the other one, uh, we also have uh, implemented uh, solubility and then precipitation. And so this one is more focused on to help students to have the microscopic understanding of those symbolic and also the um, microscopic of you know how uh, the chemical um, compounds they dissolve in water became iron, how do they recombine into the precipitate, right? And then we give them also some drawing, so visualization of how that happened in the, uh, you know, drawing of this uh, molecule level, right? Molecular level, um, how that actually happened and then explain. So with that, students also have to do their own practice. And so uh, with the support of the simulation. And so these are um, ongoing um, and then my student uh, were, uh, is already uh, doing some analysis. So we want to see how uh, these uh, pre-lab activity actually can help students uh, with um, preparing for lab report and also the uh, you know, psychomotor skills and with uh, conceptual understanding uh, and with, uh, for these this, uh, chemistry topics. Right, so um, for this study, um, you know, what we learned is that online simulation are effective to improve student uh, conceptual understanding in multiple uh, chemistry topics. And the student believes that simulation are effective because they are fun, they are interactive, and then you know, they improve their visualization and then connect with real world examples. Um, some other things we still need to, to, to do, and also these are coming from student perspective too. Uh, some of the students reported, you know, they have some technology barriers, especially when we assign a simulation uh, outside the classroom. Right? So uh, some students may have difficulty with, um, like, um, you know, how to um, manipulate some part of the simulation. 
right? So uh, we, um, for that, we hope that we can make some uh, short videos to guide them through um, more clearly with you know, those um, technology aspects of the simulation. And we will also um, do more for in terms of the immediate and then targeted feedback. And we hope that uh, you know, we can link more resources with the formative assessment to students if they want to do uh, more additional learning um, with that. All right, um, so I think I want to stop a little, see if there's any question uh, from the audience. If you have any question, you can um, drop in the chat or you can unmute and ask before I move on to the next project. <laughs> so, uh, well, well, great great project and very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So um, the, the, uh, the vendor company of the, uh, of the software, uh, are they sp specialized in chemistry, chemical engineering related, uh, sp specialized uh, in, in these fields, or they also have uh, simulation uh, systems for other disciplines? Um, yeah, a good question. I think uh, this is actually a open source for the FAT simulation. I, you know, most of the simulation I use is from FAT and it's developed by a, I think, University of Colorado. And then, you know, they, I think they had a project perhaps from NSF. And so it's uh, mostly across uh, STEM um, disciplines. For example, they have many physics, um, um, physics and then chemistry and uh, uh, mass, perhaps some of that biology, you know, engineering, and so there are many um, different other uh, disciplines. But I think mostly a uh, focus on extent uh, disciplines. Yeah, I think I think I shared a uh, slide before, and you can access the link. There's some link over there underneath the um, the simulation, and you can click that. And there's many many simulations. And then uh, some simulations, we, I think there, there are many free ones. And these are the ones that we feel like are more aligned with what we teach you know, here at CSUN, right? So we select them on purpose. And another good thing about it is not, they, not only having the simulation, uh, if you uh, log in as a uh, teacher, they have many uh, activities already developed by other people for that simulation you can actually download and directly use and modify slightly. So when we um, you know, uh, design those activities, we actually upload it also uh, on their website with very clear uh, notes of, you know, and also assessments, right? So you can actually download. And then I believe there's a way you can search by level, you know, it can be uh, K-12 level, high school, and then college level. And then you know subject, uh, so you can actually do some search, so you can find what you know related to uh, what you want to use. Then you can um, you know look at the list of the materials and then um, download and then uh, use it directly or modify it slightly to teach in your class. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. I mean, your, your, your connection is not very good. Your, yeah. your, your voice is kind of intermittent. All right. So is it better now? Okay. Yeah, so it seems better. You talked about the PODO method, right. which you contrasted with uh, the simulation. So uh -huh. I'm not a chemist. So can you elaborate a little bit more? What is the PODO method? How is it different from the simulation? Sure. Yeah. PODO um, is called um, process-oriented inquiry-based learning, right? So the difference is, uh, I guess the same is that we try to build some inquiry. Uh, we don't want to just give the student lecture, right? So usually uh, POGO is uh, those uh, activities, they give students some data or give them some, some information, give some questions for students to think about it before they are formally introduced. So this is a good way to uh, have some exploration for students to really think about it, you know, for the topics they are going to learn. And also it's focused on the process. It's not like the outcome, right? So it's okay, you make mistakes. You know, we're not looking for the correct answer here. We hope that you really start thinking about this and then uh, do some critical thinking here. And so in simulation activity, I think along uh, that line is very similar, but I think the addition is that the visualization and the manipulation. Right, so uh, for um, Pogo, usually, you know, we do work worksheet, we give them those questions to build the inquiry. But for simulation, it's more like you can see it, 
right? That's the big difference. Like you can see those molecules in the molecular level, which is very hard for students to visualize sometimes. You can give them a picture, but the picture is different than you actually can uh, move things around and you can, you know, uh, adjust, like you can actually change your variable and you can see the change of the dialog variable. So I think the difference is more like hands-on and uh, interactive in a way compared to this uh, program activity uh, that uh, you know also gives space for students to think about uh, the the you know the the, the science before uh, they are asked to, to you know remember anything or to do the calculation for example right so there's more space for them to explore and thinking does that answer your question thank you very much thank you um, any other questions before I move on. All right, good. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next study that uh, I have uh, studied a couple of um, novel learner center assessments that try to um, help students to make some connections across the topics. And so the reason why we want to do that, of course, is try to help students to do some meaningful learning. Uh, if you are a educator, you know, sometimes when we teach students, um, you know, we have uh, chapter after chapter, a student may learn really well when they learn a chapter, but then you know when uh, you, you finish with chapter um, eight, they don't remember anything from chapter one or two, right? So uh, we hope that students can have some holistic learning and then make some connections across the topics. And so that's the differences between low learning and minimal learning, meaningful learning. And so this is uh, the blocks that I built for my daughter's uh, um, blocks. And so the analogy here is that, you know, when you have a bunch of random letters, I ask you to remember, and uh, I believe you can do so. Everybody here is very smart, right? And I believe you can do so maybe in two minutes or three. And, but the, the problem is that uh, how long can you remember that? And if I ask you uh, after, you know, uh, right after this talk, you can still remember. But if I ask you after three days, can you remember that? Right, so that is uh, the role learning. If students try to use memorization, try to really, you know, uh, to memorize everything they learn, they're not gonna stay, uh, they're not gonna retain. So uh, instead, uh, if we, uh, the meaningful learning here, right, I try to organize them in a new order, which is learn chemistry, right? And now it's much easier. I believe you can remember it in one second. And after three days, I hope you still remember it easily, right? So that's like the ideal case. Uh, so what we hope, right, this is a con, um, continuum. So what we hope is to move this uh, to the side of the meaningful learning for students, right, by having these, um, you know, assessment to um, kind of guide them and to help them to make some connections across the topics they learned. And then, you know, they will move this uh, to their long-term memory. And so on the right, that's the um, example that, you know, we hope that student can, uh, can get Right, so they are all connected, right? You have to um, be able to do this connection and then you know, all of these uh, topics will stay uh, longer in your brain. All right, so what, um, there are a couple of them. So the first one is called creative exercises. And so uh, we give students a prompt, uh, in this prompt, uh, if you don't understand chemistry, don't worry about it, don't panic, it's okay. <laughs> so, um, so this is a, a typical uh, thermal chemistry problem. So what we hope students do usually is that we give them um, this information and uh, this is a dissociation reaction. And then so this reaction um, um, release, uh, release heat. And then when that uh, release heat in the solution and then the reaction happens in the solution and then they're supposed to heat up the water. But then we expect a student to know how much and then we want them uh, usually in a traditional problem student is gonna be asked to find the final temperature of the water. And so this is usually a calculation type of problem. And, but in this problem, we ask them to write down as many as they can, correct, distinct, and relevant statement. Uh, and then we give them point for each statement. We don't punish, punish them if they write anything wrong. Uh, so they can write as much as, much as they can. Um, so here's the rubrics. And then the rubrics come with, uh, we have multiple instructors. We uh, brainstorming and then we think about, you know, what are the possibilities that student can have uh, for their statements, right, related to this prompt. And as you can see, they can come from, you know, all these different topics that students learned before in the, uh, in the class. 
And it can be mathematic, it can be conceptual. And then we just hope that students use this opportunity to uh, really think about what they have learned can be connected to what they learned uh, in this uh, chapter. And um, the uh, one to emphasize also is this is a dynamic process. We, we don't limit it to this rubric because we, uh, when we grade, we look at student response. Sometimes students are more creative, you know, than we, uh, if the whatever they wrote, uh, they actually are correct and then relevant. And then we give them points. And so we will put them into part of the rubric. So it's a, a living document that uh, we keep adding uh, uh, to this to uh, become a, you know, the rubrics for from uh, based on students response to. All right, so here's the design. Uh, this is actually one of my first uh, master students project. Uh, uh, he is right now, uh, uh, his uh, name's Alex, and he's right now actually a faculty member at a community college um, who, teaching, uh, who is teaching chemistry. So what we did is that we have done uh, for uh, two settings. And one is at um, CSUN here. The other one is at a community college. And then we have these uh, one instructor teach two courses again and then we have one we said uh, treatment, the other one we said control. And then so for the treatment group, we have used creative exercises, uh, CE, and um, plus some of the traditional assessment. Then for the control group, we use traditional assessment, which is the multiple choice questions, uh, as you can see on the right, right? So those are multiple choice questions. They have the same amount of points uh, during, for the exams. Um, but they are related to this prompt. They are, you know, usually what we give uh, in a traditional uh, uh, exam. And so we use this assessment as group activities and uh, also um, um, as part of the exam, uh, usually are just 10% of the exam. And it also gives students extra credit uh, before the final to uh, uh, do this um, activity. Uh, so what we want to know is how, to what extent uh, do these activities impact student performance and retention? And how do students link chemistry uh, topics um, when they answer um, the creative exercises across time? And we want to know, you know what are students' perceptions, um, uh, perceptions of using the uh, activity. So here is the data we uh, analyze. So uh, because we have you know, multiple classes, and so what we do is we try to find something in common across the classes. So we did this score. This score is we use individual student score minus the mean of the um, two classes and divided by standard deviation. So that we will have a measure kind of to see uh, the differences um, you know, across the students across the class. And so, uh, we um, analyze that by you know two different setting, and as you can see, uh, for the treatment group, for every exam, they they perform higher. And so both setting and setting two is actually better. Uh, we believe the reason why is the frequency is higher because in a second setting we actually implemented more uh, for the uh, for the creative accesses. And also overall, in the end, uh, we look at the student grade and we can uh, we find that uh, those red ones, right, so student uh, in a treatment group, they had higher um, A and B and C, less D and F, and the DFW rate uh, decreased for both of the setting and both of the classes. And then uh, we wonder, you know, how students actually uh, link their concepts and then progress over time. So what we did is we built a series of the vision maps. This is created by a, um, a, a software. So what we did is that we look at student uh, statements in uh, the exams, right? We, we took the setting two, and then we have exam one, two, three, four. And we try to figure out, you know, what are the topics students have used uh, and how much they have used, right? To uh, analyze, uh, to answer those uh, creative accesses. So um, what you can see here is that uh, the, um, the size of the bubble. So um, from before that, um, let me explain how do we um, do the analysis. So each of the statements student wrote, we code them uh, to be a topic right, that we teach in the chemistry class. So each statement, it can be one or two, sometimes it can be two. Uh, so that will be assigned a, um, a topic. And then, uh, so if you see those bubbles, right, the bubbles are the topics, and if they are bigger, that means that uh, more statement student used to, um, uh, for these topics to answer the uh, CEs. And 
Another thing is that how much they are connected to each other. Right? So um, that is uh, related to the color, right? If they are darker, which means that uh, students are more likely uh, to connect that topic with other topics. Right? So these is uh, two things. One is how frequent they are um, has been used uh, by the students. And the other one is how much they are being connected uh, by the students. And so um, the general pattern here is you see that once that move on across the time from one, two, three, four, uh, the um, student has been used more of the topics because they're more spread out. And um, we also um, know that those um, darker, um, the darker, um, the darker circles, they are uh, the current topics that students use. So they are, you know, uh, more connected with other ones. And so those maps tells us, you know, they have some opportunities that we can use. For example, if you look at the exam three, right? So the the, the connection between atoms with uh, bonding has been actually pretty thin. And so that can be opportunity for the instructor to intervene and to, you know, show them the possibility or remind them, right? We see, uh, you know, we can connect with atoms with bonding, of course, you know, atoms uh, are the, fun uh, the fundamental building blocks to make uh, molecules and then different type of molecules and depending on different type of atoms, right? So that was like uh, some kind of um, possibilities that based on these analysis, we can uh, intervene and then helps you to build a connection when you see uh, that's like a opportunity. And so that is the benefit of it. All right, so uh, we, um, you know, definitely um, want to know how students think about this and how this actually change student uh, learning. And so we um, have students um, talk about, they uh, mention that these help them with the knowledge interrogation because they have to use all the things they learn in the uh, class to learn to answer this one question, right? They, they try really hard. Uh, they uh, also use this to explain the reasoning, what happened, why happened uh, for the concept they learned. And they believe that uh, this gives them a space to think about what they have learned. And then, um, you know, because the uh, rubric is open, uh, they, any of the correct answer they have can be, you know, added to the rubric. So um, they uh, like that. And then also the, we find that these help students to think more critically, right? They're building some of the effective uh, study uh, strategies because they have to really um, challenge themselves and then, uh, you know, study more actually to, uh, and also go back, pay basically every exam, they have to go back to uh, check what they have learned in the previous um, chap chapters. And connect with people is more like, you know, we, um, we do group activities and students actually reported that they like to have this, uh, to have discussion with other students so they can know what other people have come up with, right? that kind of expand their knowledge with the uh, discussion with other students. Um, so with that, we actually did a follow-up study, um, not only just using creative accesses, and then we also use something called concept mapping. I don't know if you are familiar with that. So basically that is a uh, kind of visualization tool. And so we have um, this concept mapping um, is quite famous in the science community. And so we'll have a box that represent uh, one topic and then you can have some uh, other boxes to represent uh, some of the subtopics or the concept related to that topic. And you also have to write why these two topics are connected to each other, right? So build this networking uh, for the, uh, uh, the concepts that you, uh, they have learned and to build this uh, map. Uh, all the concepts are there and then they can connect them with this map. And so this is an example from one of the students. We teach them how to use uh, software to, uh, to build this kind of map. And then uh, you can see that it's color coded and then a different color represents, you know, every week a student will go back to it and then add more based on what they learned, right? So that way they can connect it to uh, what they have learned already. And so uh, this is a, um, so for this study, we actually uh, conducted uh, at uh, UC Riverside with one of my colleague, uh, Jack Eichler. And so what we did is that uh, he taught the same class uh, and then he has four different uh, recitation sections. And so um, we implemented with two, uh, four different uh, uh, groups. The first group, uh, control group, this is in the recitation sections and uh, they have the same lecture, right? The recitation is different and they are taught by teaching assistants. And so they, uh, the control group just did a uh, uh, calculation based type of question. 
And because for equilibrium and essay base, we have many of those questions that traditionally we use uh, to teach students. Then we have a group called uh, CM only. They used concept map only uh, in the this, um, you know, recitation section. They just have to make the concept map with you know, some of those uh, concepts they have learned. And then CE group, uh, this group, they, they have done uh, the creative exercises. And uh, the last group just has both. And so we want to know, you know if there's any double, um, double dose effect, right? For example, like you are uh, thinking about the medicine, medical uh, field. And so we ask, uh, you know, what are the similarities and differences between concept map and creative exercises from student perspective? And how do they actually influence to each other? And we also want to ask uh, to, to know, um, you know, do students believe that that improves their conceptual understanding and the connection making? And so for this study, we only focus on two, um, you know, it's a short period and then six weeks. So we focus on two concepts, um, two topics, concept, uh, uh, chemical equilibrium and assay base. And also we want to know, you know, how these, um, you know, uh, especially uh, coping tool, uh, will affect the uh, efficiency of the learning as compared to when we use this uh, one assessment law. So here is from student um, perspective and we survey students and we ask them uh, for, you know, comparison. Uh, this is a comparison from the student who used both and uh, also the uh, student used only one of it. Right? We ask them, uh, you know, um, do you believe that this assessment um, help you improve conceptual understanding? And also make connections across the concepts in chemistry, and uh, we can uh, we find that the student uh, use both uh, assessments. They have higher percentage reported to saying yes, right? So uh, as compared to the one that only uh, used one of it, and so that is a, a good um, you know good effect that we see. Um, and then um, we have done a lot of, you know, uh, question, open-ended questions, and then we interview students, ask them about the perspective. And so we developed this uh, concept map to organize all the themes because there are, um, you know, a lot of them. And so we try to figure out how uh, these two assessments actually help, help student learning. Uh, so we see some common themes. Uh, student reported for both, uh, they, you know, uh, reinforce the prior knowledge, they help students connect uh, chemistry concepts, they deepen the chem uh, chem uh, conceptual understanding, and also uh, they simulate a metacognition. Basically, they, these help them think about what they know, right? So help them to really reflect and then connect. And so this is what we call metacognition, right? So is thinking of thinking, uh, so that uh, both reported that. And interestingly, um, that student reported um, the concept map helped them to answer uh, creative exercises, but not vice versa. So that's interesting. And uh, another interesting thing is that uh, student believe that the concept map are more personal, more personalized. They prefer to just create their own map and then use it as a learning tool for themselves uh, when they learned uh, chemistry concepts. But for the creative exercises, they actually prefer to work with another group uh, student to you know, see what other students come up and then they can expand and then learn from each other and then you know, being able to do well on this kind of uh, assessment. Um, so another analysis we have done is we actually interview students. And so what we did is we selected a representative group from each of the um, uh, group and then we uh, basically, <clears throat> we sit with them. We give them all kinds of uh, chemistry reactions, right? We ask them to explain to us what's going on here. Can you uh, talk about this reaction? You know, we talk about all of these like principles and the theories related to these two topics. Can you uh, impact and then tell us what's going on here? And so uh, this framework is developed by a, a literature-based uh, framework. And so some other scholar has developed um, a framework that uh, is about student understanding of uh, the these two uh, chemistry topics, and so they are hierarchical, right? So from the top to the bottom, one, two, three, four, and basically is that we try to categorize student understanding for these two topics uh, from the lower order to higher order, and um, you know the highest order is students uh, are able to uh, talk about what's going on, what is um, happening in a reaction, and then how the reaction happened, which is very important, explaining the reasoning. And so that is the uh, principle theory uh, mechanistic. 
And um, for on the left, uh, so basically we have these three groups, we categorize them by percentage of the response of students that uh, you know, uh, responded to us for those questions in the interview. What is the percentage of them belong to these categories, right? So as you can see, <clears throat> the last group, uh, the one that use both CM and CE, they have higher percentage of the, um, the top two. Uh, the what, uh, the, the number three and number four, <clears throat> the descriptive and the, the mechanistic uh, uh, percentage that uh, uh, coming from this group of students. So we believe that um, the both uh, assessment, uh, the, the group with the both assessment, they were able to provide more sophisticated uh, explanation among those uh, topics that we targeted at for um, the students to learn. All right, so um, what we learned from these study is that we um, find you know, open-ended assessments, they improve student performance and uh, they help the student to make connections across uh, chemistry topics and also the different type of assessment um, that uh, definitely influence uh, students' learning approaches and then the abilities to explain uh, the chemical uh, principles and the theories. What else can be done? Uh, we hope that we will incorporate some drawing, some visualization uh, in the assessment prompt. So that way students have the opportunity to connect across the uh, presentations. And also we hope to make the grading easier. Sometimes the implementation, if you need more time to grade that you know, kind of uh, um, stop people to do it. And so for especially you know, if you have a large enrollment course like 200 students. So we try to figure out the way to um, make it more efficient for grading I will show you an example that uh, we already developed something uh, that uh, to help um, with that aspect. And also we will um, ask students more uh, to explain what they learn, right? Try to promote this higher order thinking instead of just giving them the multiple choice questions. And so here's one of the example that we have used. Uh, we have this uh, follow-up study called uh, Measures of Link Concepts and Metacognition. So uh, what we did is we use the same prompt. We give this uh, real world scenario uh, in this um, prompt. We you know, give them the chemical structure and then we build in the statements that uh, uh, across all different uh, chapters that uh, students you know, are, supposed to be, uh, are, supposed, uh, are supposed to learn. And then we're building some, you know, current topics they just learned. Uh, and then for this one, it's about, um, you know, molecular structure. And then uh, we we uh, put other, um, you know, uh, statements that are belonging to the previous um, previous uh, um, chapters. And then one thing we have done is we give students a list of all the learning objectives, right? So that's like, you know, seven point five. Uh, that's from the seven ch chapter seven, 1.3, that's from chapter one. Students have the list of the learning objectives. And then uh, after they're done, they have immediate feedback. And then we ask them, you know, what uh, learning objective did you miss? And then what is your plan to master those learning objectives? Right? So not only finish, just finish, you have to think about it. You know, you have to fill your gaps, right? If you haven't mastered uh, you know, learning objective 7.7, .7, you have to go back to check. What is that? How do you do that, right? If you forget about uh, learning objective 4.4, now is the time you need to go back and then <clears throat> fill the gap. And so this is, um, you know, we just do true and false and then it's easy to grade. And also it's easy to analyze as an instructor to see what are the gaps across the, <clears throat> across the semester, right? Like, uh, the you know your, your student actually need to uh, do, and you can also uh, you know get a mini uh, maybe have a mini review for some of the topics that you um, observe that uh, they are not uh, student haven't learned it yet. All right, uh, questions? Anything that uh, before I move on? I, I like the con uh, concept map <laughs> that that yeah. enabled me to organize my my lectures. I mean to summarize my lectures into into concept map. <laughs> yeah, I I think so. I've read uh, the concept map is about uh, also the language barrier. I think it's very useful for me as an international, you know, like a not not first language uh, learner. Uh, sometimes, yeah, you have those very simple, very simplified version of the you know the text 
I think that helps me myself too to organize what I want to teach, right? And in a way, it's simple, and uh, you can, you know, unpack that if you want. But it's a framework for you to organize your information in a way is uh, relatively straightforward. Instead, if you have all these big chunk of text uh, for anal for anal for kind of explained uh, everything, is actually quite you know challenging, right? Question for you, Dr. Ye. Sure. Um, is that how do you build the quantitative relations into these conceptual maps? You mean the grading part? No, no, no. That you see, they are formulas yeah. and equations. You know, yeah. because there's um, that's a really good question. Some students complain about it. They don't really have an opportunity to that. Right? We the the concept map is mainly for conceptual development. Um, so if they want, they can write the equations there and explain what is this about, right? What are the variables? They can do that. There's no, no, you know, rule that you cannot use any formula for this. But I think the development uh, mostly we focus on is a conceptual development for the using the concept maps. It's called concept maps. But you know, some students uh, when we did it for online. And then you know it's actually difficult to build those equations with you know the some of the superscripts, right? And then the very you know, so they don't really have a. If you have the uh, paper, it's easier you can write that. But if it's like the online version, it's actually quite hard to build the formula. Uh, so some students said you know actually you know if if we can um, find some software that will be better implemented uh, to they can put the formula that will be nice. Yeah. They're very sharp. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, so uh, I'm gonna move on to the last study. Hopefully this one's a short one. And so the last study, um, you know, we all know science is difficult and uh, for all the introductory chemistry courses, we have very high DFW rate. One of the biggest one is uh, chemistry 100, which is the, you know, basically the first science class uh, student take at CSUN. And the DFW rate is so high, but it's a, such a high impact course because we have um, about um, 1,200 students um, take this class every year. And so think about it, you know, if we have uh, that many students take it and then more than ha about half of the students failed, so that only that one class failed 500 students every year, right? And then also, you know, we learned that um, uh, the DFW rate in early years actually impacts student graduation rate a lot. Some students actually just left because of that one grade. So it's very high impact. And then we try to figure out how to, you know, uh, save students' life <laughs> in this course. And so, uh, we uh, worked with a couple of departments for this project. It's been a couple of semesters. And so we implement a uh, peer-led uh, supplemental instruction. So uh, we all know that, you know, science is not easy to learn. You need to take time and you need to do it. And so uh, the best way really uh, to learn well is by doing it. A lot of time in the introduction, uh, introductory uh, class, the students don't really know. Uh, they have to spend a lot of time outside the classroom to really apply the concept and knowing, you know, they have to do it with, you know, really uh, a lot of practice outside the class, right? So what we try to do is to build this structure for students and we work with uh, Learning Resources Center and then uh, we, we do have this uh, section before, which is only two, but then we, you know, uh, work with the Learning Resources Center Student Success uh, Office to expand that uh, to pretty much all the classes. So which is 20 sections right now. Um, and we make them uh, mandatory because it is voluntary and then students don't take them or the best students are in the, <laughs> in the sections. And so uh, this is a 50 minutes uh, class before and after lecture twice a week. And we have hired um, the peer leaders who are the students who are undergrads they already finished the class. They did really well in the class and they um, have very good communication skills. And so they facilitate those um, small group um, collaborative problem solving sections. And so um, the you know, theory uh, background is that, uh, you know, we have different uh, capacities, right? Sometimes we can learn something without assistance. Sometimes we cannot learn um, 
even with the system. But as an in, in the media area, which is called the zone of the proximal development, we can, um, you know, with some assistance, students can learn well. So this is the uh, area we want to expand with their peers. Right? With the peers, they feel more comfortable actually. So uh, they are actually more um, willing to learn during these sections. And so as a leader got a lot of training and they get paid and then uh, they teach these classes. And so this is a class that we uh, set up uh, as a uh, independent um, class and then students um, get credit, non-credit only based on the attendance. And so we have done this for three semesters already. <clears throat> and uh, in the uh, 421, uh, we have all the students uh, enrolled. And then that was virtual because, you know, COVID. And then uh, the spring 22, we have only half of the student uh, come back to in-person. The reason why is that we don't have enough students to teach. So there's a staffing issue there. Um, so we just only have half of the student. Um, we cancel some of the sections. And uh, uh, in the fall 22, last semester, we uh, come back to four, fully in person. We have all the students enrolled in these sections. Here are some pictures that you can see how uh, the SI leaders teach. Sometimes they give a mini lecture, sometimes they use the whiteboard, and then most of the students just work together as a group. And then um, they have worksheet to work on and then uh, get uh, some guidance from those leaders. And so um, I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm just going to give you some uh, uh, some you know uh, sh um, uh, snapshot of it. So basically, uh, we separate these three um, semester. The first semester we focus on what's the impact of the virtual SI, what are the factors related to that, and we have a case study which is one of the SI leader who did great job that you know has a very high uh, student outcome compared to all the other SI leaders. So we we interviewed her. And I want to know, you know, how she actually teach, and then we want to use that to train other uh, SI leaders. The second study uh, is the half half, right? We have about half a student in person uh, in the um, in this SI, and then we uh, want to know, you know, how much in person SI improved student learning, and then with the uh, longitudinal, rate, we actually track student to a next class and see long term how this um, SI impact the student in the next class. And then we go back to uh, fully in person and we just compare this data to the past year, ten, past 10 years data and see how the SI interrupt with the DFWA. And then we also look at all the, uh, you know, the survey data from students, uh, SI leader and instructor and to see, you know, what are the uh, recommendations we can uh, use to improve the program. Uh, so here's the uh, research question. Uh, we want to know, you know, how the program improves student success uh, with different teaching modes, and then what are the factors related to that, and then what are the best practices to teach this SI class. And so here is the um, first semester virtual, right? So um, before, because everybody is in SI, we don't have a good comparison group uh, with the same semester, so we compare to the semester before that. And then uh, we have the common, you know, materials, common exam, common online homework, all of that are common. And most instructors, they are the same. And we find that uh, the SI group uh, improved about half, like a partial letter grade, uh, which is 0 0.030 for their course GPA. And there's a positive relationship with the SI uh, and in the student uh, course uh, GPA. Um, and we want to know also, you know, what are the factors that are related to the uh, student outcome? And so we put those factors with uh, student demographic data, uh, including underrepresented minority status, gender, first generation uh, status, you know, the student who uh, are the first one who go to the four year um, university, um, then, uh, um, then then pair grant uh, status. And so we find that two significant predictors which is SI, which is um, the uh, minority status. Right? So which means that these are the two significant predictors that predict students' uh, learning outcome in the Chem 100 class that is measured by a uh, course GPA. And then so not only that, we uh, want to know uh, if there any interaction between SI and URM, which means that if, if SI in, um, disproportional, disproportionately impact those minority students. And so that's the second multiple regression. We see there's a negative uh, factor, which means that uh, SI actually um, improved non-minority students more 
Um, so by these, you know, you can see on the right also, right? So the improvement for the blue is the non-minority actually improved more compared to the uh, URM for this virtual SI, which is not what we want, but uh, this is what happened for the virtual SI. And we also separate out uh, by more factors and uh, we look at, you know, by every uh, ethnicity and we can find actually, uh, even though, you know, they helped now, um, URM student more aging and white student, but also it did help black student also uh, as much, but not for the Hispanic and Latino student. Right? So that is, um, you know, the uh, kind of uh, the differences uh, has been made by different race. And then for uh, the native, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Hawaii and um, Pacific Islander, we have a very small sample. So it doesn't really uh, have a good pattern there. And then we also find as I hoped freshmen the most, across the uh, academic, um, uh, academic level. And uh, we also analyzed the SI leader impact. We find this one SI leader is very outstanding and her class has a very high average 3.5. That's pretty much uh, you know, across the board. You see that it's very, very uh, effective compared to all the other SI leaders. So interview this SI leader, ask her how she teach and try to find the best practice of teaching the SI classes. Um, so we interviewed this um, SI leader and then before that we go through all her students uh, surveys and then herself reflection and we come up with some questions to ask her, uh, you know, how do you teach basically uh, for the chem uh, chemistry at 100 SI and describe to us right and then and then what are the things you have done you believe that uh, actually help you uh, to uh, for your student learn. And so here are the themes we find. That, so she used a lot of uh, very great, um, you know, teaching strategies has been reported in the literature. And um, I will highlight a couple of them, especially for the online teaching. Uh, she has been, um, she has done a great job of um, building a community and using collaborative learning and also use some very unique assessment technique and then teaching students how to learn. And so I will highlight a couple of those and so that uh, you have some idea of that. So uh, the first one, building report. She is so good at um, connect with her students. So every time when she's uh, on Zoom, she will join early. She always asks them, you know, uh, checking with them and then also uh, to learn what they like and then connect that uh, to the teaching. And then for the uh, class, she always um, have, uh, you know, breakout rooms and to have students to use the shared document to work on the practice problems. And then she will also go to every bright column to see how they're doing. And then um, the good thing, uh, the, the also one of the very good things she does is she never gives you the answers. She always redirect the question. So students have to think about it and then you know come up with the answers on their own. So this is also a very good strategy that has been reported in the literature of uh, how to facilitate uh, the group uh, learning. And um, the purpose for uh, assessment technique she has um, many mini quizzes uh, in her class. And so usually at the beginning, she gave more time and she gave student resources. For example, you know, the table of the SRB table, she would give them at the beginning of this uh, quiz. Then she would give them another quiz the next day. And then that will be um, shorter time, remove the resources. A student need to actually do it faster. And then they don't have any support during this um, assessment time. And she also purposely teach how um, you can learn or how do you, um, you know, um, learn effectively. Right? So she um, teach students uh, for the strategy she used for her study. For example, you can make this index card with color coded. Right? So you can easily see which one is the polyatomic ion, which one is the transition matter. And then you can very quickly know, uh, you know your notes uh, through these strategies. She has done a lot of other things too. Uh, but uh, by talking to her, you know, she's a fantastic teacher. And we did look at the student groups based on the student um, background and the student uh, demographic. Her class is just the same. It's not, you know, she has the best students. She just has the same student, but she is a fantastic teacher that she, um, you know, actually was able to, um, you know, help students so much. All right, so next one is we move on to in-person. Uh, when we move on in-person, you know, we have the next semester, we actually came back to in-person, but because of the subbing issue, we only have half a student in SI, the other half are not. And so this gave us an opportunity to actually to see, you know, the student in the same semester, right, what are the differences has been made by the SI. 
And then we find it's a huge impact. SI improved almost one letter grade, and then they decreased the uh, DFW rate by 24% uh, compared to the student without SI. And more exciting is that SI improved uh, for this in-person SI improved for the URM student more. Right? You can see the improvement. And that's about two, um, point, uh, 0 0.27. Then the student uh, uh, from the uh, non-minority student group. So this is uh, really exciting to see. Um, you know, the SI actually uh, started to uh, close the equity gap. Um, then we look at the students from uh, the semester with half half in the uh, SI, a uh, non-SI. We track them and uh, so see what they how they're doing in the next class they're supposed to take. So there are about 50% of the students who actually go to take Chem 100, 101. And then uh, we look at Chem 101 grade with the student uh, with and without SI. And then we find that uh, the um, student actually still uh, have a higher um, grade in the Chem 101 with the student uh, you know, who took the SI in Chem 100. And there's no SI in 101, but the impact has lasted. And then the DFW rate still uh, or lower uh, for those students who took uh, SI in a Chem 100. So uh, we believe that uh, the impact has been uh, lasted to the next class also. Um, so this is the uh, slide that uh, shows that uh, we have uh, fully implemented in last semester for 2020 and all the students inside in person, right? As you can see the pattern in the past 10 years is you know pretty bad. It's always like 40% above. And then we compare uh, all in person, that is the 2019 uh, fall before the pandemic. And then that's like the average is about uh, 39%. And then now we have dropped that uh, DFW rate by uh, 17%. Uh, so that is uh, at least we move along for students, um, you know, at least more than half of them. Uh, they are uh, passing this class and then they move on. And uh, um, qualitative data, so we uh, survey students every semester after they finish SI. Now we have 1,240 students have participated in SI and then uh, did this survey with us. And we find majority of the students really liked SI. They believe that uh, these problem solving, solving section helped them learn. And the class was um, really uh, engaging. And then they believe that they have this individualized support and also um, you know, the SI leaders are they're all very, uh, very happy uh, to teach them and passionately did. And they also feel like there's a sense yeah. of community there. And so um, some of the thing we learn from the students uh, is that they would like to have more uh, visualization handwriting instead of just, in, just having, you know, people uh, talking to them. So they like to have the notes in, on the board. So now we talk to the SI co uh, coordinator and then uh, she required all SI leader to use the board instead of just you know talking uh, uh, with uh, with them for the problems, and then um, so some of the feedback has been addressed uh, from the students, um, and then we keep improving the program to uh, meet student needs. And uh, we look at the SI leader surveys, and then those survey uh, says that uh, you know the SI leader they are students too, right? So they improved a lot for their presentation skills, communication skills, teaching skills. Right, so not only benefit the students who are in a class, but also for the students who get training in teaching, and then they uh, have the opportunity to, um, uh, to practice their uh, teaching skills that, um, that improve their uh, competence and then their uh, abilities to uh, teach uh, in the future too. And instructors, uh, instructors also, uh, we, we um, you know, uh, we, we also, you know, um, survey instructors, they reported to us that, uh, you know, the uh, SI leader um, are really great to help them with the lecture activity also, and also that, uh, you know, help students in the class. Uh, so they are uh, wanted to uh, have this program uh, sustainable. And so we learned that, you know, the program is really effective uh, to help students learn. And then we learned that uh, the different teaching mode uh, uh, impact student differently, right? So with Sporcher is uh, impact uh, um, non-URM student more and in-person impact URM student more. And then we know that impact lasted to the future chemistry classes too. And uh, we know that SI leader matter and then how they teach really matter. 
And we hope that we can keep this SI program sustainable because it's very expensive to run a program. <laughs> we have like about 20 SI leaders, we have to pay them. And uh, we also learned that we need to support the minority student more because uh, we still have gap, even though we improve their performance, the gap is still there. So we need to think about how to help them with more like a, a transferable skills in the future. All right, so uh, I think uh, this is uh, the you know question time. If you want to ask any question, I know time is almost, I have a few more slides. Hopefully we can finish in time. Nice. Uh, I, I'm really impressed by how much that at least uh, on campus um, teaching that SI had helped with students, all students, uh, not just uh, the URM, but also all the students. Um, so the question is, um, I, I think that's similar to what in, at the tier one university, you always have a, a teaching assistant, uh, graduate assistant that right. assisting the student with all uh, the learning materials. But we haven't done it before, even though we have very large classes in in some subjects. So that's definitely the right way to go. So mm -hmm. you said at the last slide that you know where does the money come from, right? Right yeah. now, where does the money come from right now? Uh, right now, the money come from the provost office. Uh, the pro the last provost was very supportive for this program, and uh, we communicate with multiple, uh, you know, uh, office, right, in the Student Success Office, the Learning Resources Center, and the last uh, provost, uh, uh, Mary Beth, she was very supportive, and uh, she supported for this program. I think the money is from the, the, the CQF money, mm -hmm. I, I think, and yeah, I'm, you know, definitely what I, my job is to show them the evidence, so I hope that uh, the very strong evidence can convince them that, you know, this is working, let's just keep it going. But uh, I don't know, this is uh, definitely something that um, is being under discussion and then I'm not sure this is gonna be a long-term, uh, you know, possibly long-term for us or uh, the new administration may, you know, have some uh, other priorities, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, definitely, you know, my chair and I, we really deeply believe that, uh, you know, with the large enrollment class, with the student feel the class is super difficult, we need this kind of structure, right, resources to support them outside of the classroom. So that way, you know, they are able to have a space that really they can sit down with support to really learn, <laughs> to apply the knowledge. Otherwise, you know, it, it is difficult. Uh, if, you know, there will be a lot of uh, differences across the student body uh, who may or may not have the resources. Especially with the URM. Actually, I'm, I may have a conjecture about why the URM student didn't um, do as well online as they are on campus. Right. So the conjecture is something I don't try, you know, they, they don't really engage that well in online setting, but in the real life setting, they can engage a lot better for the URM because they didn't really know how to learn in uh, online you know, right. environment. It's kind of hard for them. So yeah, yeah that's something it's really hard to overcome when you are online you know, because you are disengaged, you are disengaged, the, the instructor couldn't see you. <laughs> yeah, I think the, you know, the, there's a lot of report about um, how they don't have good internet uh, service and then maybe they are living in the more crowded, uh, noisy right. environment, by right? all of these the logistic, uh, like a, not that they can control of, right? They maybe right. work more, you know, they can like working and then they are listening to your lecture, you know, stuff yeah. like that. So they, those are all the factors that contributed to the online learning, you know, yeah. equity um, related issues. If they're in a classroom, they are there, you know, then yeah. they can it's learn. more controllable. Yeah. 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 Very um, nice, very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so I think uh, it's time. Let me just quickly go uh, a few slides, like uh, talking about my future project. Well, my project uh, I'm going to be focused on in the next three years is this project about teaching students how to learn, because I find, you know, if a student became independent learner, teacher has much less work to do, right? So uh, the project, we, what we're going to do is to build uh, online modules to uh, develop this uh, discipline-based uh, growth mindset and then uh, learning strategy modules. And so what we're gonna do is to um, build these online modules and then we're gonna use randomized uh, control experiment 
to um, study different groups of students with you know um, different uh, groups of control group. They're gonna do a lot of reading and then the uh, you know uh, group growth mindset group and then learning strategies group and then both. And so we will do uh, this uh, particular design of uh, using our um, peers and our professors at our college. And then, you know, we teach them what are those, and then we're gonna build those uh, online videos through our uh, environment, through our people, and then so they feel relatable. Right? And then we build some online uh, um, live discussions and for the um, particular uh, learning strategies, we will teach them how to study, learning the cy study cycle. We give them concrete uh, methodology uh, that uh, reported from the literature, and then uh, for the science, uh, we related to the scientific method. You know, they have to constantly make observation and then think about uh, um, you know their study strategies and re uh, revise. Right? And then we will build those um, resources for them through so, uh, the peer uh, sharing of the note taking skills. And then we will build those uh, you know video uh, you know asking students to explain the chemistry problems so they can watch those um, videos uh, with uh, you know in this. Um, community, and then we will send personalized messages and we build the resources targeted for uh, URM students. So basically we want to have this learning community who really discuss about how to study, right, for, for chemistry. And then uh, so uh, that will be part of the routine. They're gonna be constantly doing and thinking and then apply. And then we will measure, uh, you know, uh, use those uh, measurements to see if uh, they actually improved on these um, mindset and uh, learning strategies of course, hopefully improve their uh, performance as well. Another one project, uh, what I'm thinking uh, I'm doing right now is I'm gonna build a class which has been approved already. So there will be a class that's called Science Korea and we will build partnership with industry and uh, uh, including Amgen and uh, Takeda, a couple of pharmaceutical company. And so basically uh, we will have their scientists come over to talk to our students about the whole process of drug design and students will do project-based learning, you know, they're gonna study a drug depth in depth of how the drug from the very beginning, right, to the end, from the beginning of the identify the target until they launch. And then so we're gonna teach them uh, of these uh, real world uh, cases. And then we're gonna also have the students to have some experience of uh, field trips, internship, internship. And then we want to also teach students how to prepare for resume and how to prepare for interview. And also they have a lot of opportunity to networking with the, um, the you know, some of our alumni already working in the field. So I'm excited about that. And uh, hopefully, you know, we will bridge the gap between education and then the career. And um, this is just announced by the Biden um, White House administration a few weeks ago. So they actually uh, announced that uh, the next priority for the country will be advancement of the biotechnology and biomanufacturing. So hopefully, you know, when they already um, um, have that uh, uh, system set up and then we will have our student to be supplied, uh, supplied to them for this field. And um, yeah, so this is it. And then I, you know, do some other work that uh, um, if, you know, thinking about collaboration is that I am on a couple of funded projects as the consultant and senior um, personnel for uh, their uh, education plan and assessment plan. And I'm working with um, the science ed professors at CSUN to develop uh, those um, um, development for uh, teachers. And uh, we do outreach and uh, we do uh, learning series uh, on the K-12 science education. Um, so here are some pictures that we have done field trips and we have done a stage and we have done the competitions on um, the student to explain about science. We actually just launched our new one for this year. So um, we are having students to, um, you know, create a three minutes video to talk about a particular science phenomenon. And then uh, they win a lot of awards for those science kids. And so we have done this for a couple of years. And so um, student did, um, many students did great job of explaining science. Uh, so we have a lot of fun watching those videos. Um, so yeah, so thank you so much. And then this is also, uh, I want to you know, acknowledge that uh, this work has been funded by multiple agency. And uh, I have collaborated with uh, some great um, scholars and then also with my um, beautiful students uh, to make those work happen. Uh, so I think this is 
all I have. I hope it's not too much over the time. <laughs> so let me stop sharing. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I, I really learned a lot. You have a lot of materials, actually good for three different presentations. <laughs> But you it in, but we learned so much information from from you, so that's really nice. Because this is a ninety minutes. I was like ninety minutes. I should prepare a lot, and then I was like, okay, let me summarize everything I have done so far. <laughs> so, go, for, go for four four papers. One one is a a, the, a big one uh, with all the three projects, and then uh, and then one paper for each project. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some of them already published, and uh, I think. Um, it's a good timing, you know, like uh, I chat with Dr. Shen before because I just uh, put together of my tenure um, package last semester. So I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I just did a very thorough uh, analysis of what I have done, right? So I have all the um, um, PF ready. And then now I feel like uh, I, I do have more to share than, you know, if you ask me when I just join the um, during season, for example. You can begin to design a new project for your upcoming sabbatical. <laughs> yeah, I applied, but 